Hello there and welcome to Sharing Wisdom. I'm excited to have you listen in today. I've got a fantastic guest for you, Asante Cleveland, former NFL player, author of Working Through the Dark. He's here to share his insight on you know, what it's like and how to find that bright spot, working through challenges, overcoming obstacles. And when it seems like things are too dark, how do you find that bright spot to focus on? Um, I'm your host, Angie Wisdom, and I'm excited to get into this conversation. Asante, thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me, Angie. Yeah, um, I was reading through your book. I had gotten it a while ago, but I was kind of thumbing through it again and looking at some of the quotes and wow, your story. Yeah, I I felt the need to share it in 2020 when COVID happened and the lockdowns. It felt like the right time for me to just really just express like what I'd gone through um, since nobody had anywhere to go. And mm-hmm. so I grew up dealing with child abuse and the lockdowns reminded me that there are already a lot of people dealing with that and that now they are essentially trapped in their situation. And I just want to share what I learned and experience uh, to encourage them that no matter what you've gone through, you can be whatever you want to be. And I wanted to play professional sports and I was fortunate enough to figure out how to do that while overcoming the obstacles that came along the way. Yeah, I, I didn't know that that's where it stemmed from as far as like how you connected with writing the book at that time. I'm wondering, was there some kind of, I guess, like catalyst you're saying, like you were thinking about these people locked in in COVID and maybe what some of these kids were going through. Had you really shared your story so much before you decided that it was so purposeful in this point in time? I hadn't shared it publicly Mm-hmm. Since I retired, I never really thought about what happened when I was a kid because I had sports that was there to distract me. Mm-hmm. And because I was so focused on sports, I didn't really have to worry about or even think of like different emotions that I was feeling. But when I retired, I no longer had that distraction. Mm-hmm. And it took a while, but I eventually started going to therapy and getting more comfortable addressing what I went through and through in 2019, I finally decided just to write a personal essay for myself Mm -hmm. so that I could get the story out and to observe it. Mm -hmm. I never meant to share it publicly. It was just something that was weighing on me that I wanted to just have on paper. And when the lockdowns happened, it was almost like, uh, well, I've already done a lot of work in this Mm -hmm. and I was getting more comfortable sharing publicly or just with people around me, what I had gone through. Right. And so it felt like this was the next step in that process. I can't help, but think like, I believe that everything goes as planned. And from me, from a religious aspect, you know, it, things happen as they should, but talk about kind of perfect timing there as far as you getting to the space where you were willing to even write the essay for yourself, you know, to kind of come to terms with it and not verbalize it, but take it out of you and share it with yourself. And that's setting you up for this space for you to offer so much to somebody who might be going through this same situation at such a, you know, a hard, difficult time. Yeah, it a lot of the awareness came from me realizing how what happened when I was a kid was still affecting me today. Mm -hmm. And prior to retiring, I had no awareness to it. And you can't fix what you don't think is broken. And so it, it really clicked for me when I was working in this this job that I was miserable in. Mm. And I just struggled with it. The whole, it was a lot of cold calling investors and stuff like that. I struggled heavily, just didn't have the confidence to Mm -hmm. like want to call someone and then like call them back if they didn't answer or just after they've already shot me down, like continue to call them back. But I had this coworker who had no issue calling somebody nine times. They would block his number 
Uh-huh. He would call them from a Google voice number. Oh they would eventually wow. block that. And then he'd ask you for your phone to call the same person. And wow. that mindset just blew my mind. I was in awe mm. of just watching mm. the way he worked. And after learning a, a little bit about his story, I realized that growing up, he learned that there were really no consequences to his actions. There was nothing to fear. Uh, mm. There was nothing to really second guess what you were doing, where in my situation, I had to second guess everything I was doing because there was a threat of physical violence at the end of it. Right. So I was very cognizant of what I was doing. But after I saw that, I realized like, okay, there's something that I still need to address to be able to get over this mental barrier. Yeah. There's so much in that right there. Um, You know, I hear you saying like you you had real fear of consequences, right? Like sometimes people have fears, but they're almost unwarranted, right? It's just thinking of the future of like what could happen. But you were legitimately dealing with real consequences like you suffered again and again that abuse when maybe you didn't finish your homework. Maybe you didn't do what you were supposed to do. So it was a real valid thing for you. But I I think it's really interesting, too, that you were saying when you were in sports and when you were, you know, playing professional football, you didn't really have almost time to think about it. Like your mind has to be so present and focused on what you're doing that it almost allows you to avoid it, you know, and not have to deal with it. And when you became to this place that maybe you weren't so present, it really started to get, you know, highlighted what you needed to work on there. I I noticed that once, whenever there was a big pause in my life, Mm -hmm. that's when the emotions would come up. Initially, Mm -hmm. it was after I had my knee surgery, uh, my fourth year in the league. That was the first time I ever really felt those emotions bubbling up a lot. And then when I ultimately retired a year later, those started to resurface and then just were sitting with me Mm. and I didn't understand. I didn't quite quite connect where it came from. I just knew that like kind of the depression that I was feeling was deeper than I miss football. I I felt like there was a little more to what I was going through. Mm -hmm, Mm hmm. Yeah, you knew that you had to, it almost sounds like you knew you had to do a little bit more digging. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's fascinating to me that you accomplish such great feats, you know, like you're, you're talking about not having the mindset to like make a phone call, but yet you had this childhood where you were physically abused, but you went on to, you know, be great at numerous sports and and play college and then end up in the NFL for several years. So share with me, like, how does that happen? You know, how do you overcome all of that and have the mindset to be great in this career as far as football is concerned? But then it kind of comes back to bite you later, that mindset. Well, I was extremely lucky to have a dad who was a great role model, Mm -hmm. not only in providing just life wisdom, but as an athlete in his own right, he played in the NFL. He was an elite college athlete, played two sports in college. So when I started living with him full time, he got me more involved in sports. But even before that, some things that he would do early on were Uh, He would force me to memorize poems in order to play video games, because when I was at his house, that's where all my video games were. Mm. I didn't have them at the other place. So I really, really look forward to like when I spend time with my dad, obviously, I'd love to see him. But also I get to play some video games that weekend. Mm -hmm. But in fourth grade, he made it so that before I could play video games, I had to recite a poem that he had me memorize. The first one was Invictus, which is Mm -hmm. all about resilience Mm -hmm. and being able to keep your head up when things aren't going your way. Or my favorite line is under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloodied, but unbowed. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of poignant that I was learning those lessons at the time while I was dealing with the abuse. Right. But throughout life, it was helpful for me to remember that no matter what I'm going through, no matter what anyone's going through, that they can figure out how to overcome 
They just have to keep their head up, focus on their attitude and their effort, mm -hmm. and you'll, you'll figure a way. So yeah. that mindset, learning it at such an early age was helpful for me going through sports. That makes sense. And I mean, I, I can't imagine without, it was in essence like rewiring your brain, right? Yeah. Without you even kind of knowing it, like giving you thoughts to lean on and, and words and, and inspiration. And I'm, I, I wonder, like, have you ever thought about like, if you didn't have that pouring into you, if someone wasn't helping you rewire your brain all through those challenging times, would it have come out the same? Probably not. I, yeah. I think that there were plenty of times that I would have just made a lot of mistakes out of emotion, not being able mm -hmm. to keep my emotions in check. Cause that was another mm -hmm. thing that I learned early. Another poem was if, mm -hmm. um, and my the line in there is if you can meet with both triumph and disaster and treat those imposters just the same, being able to keep my emotions in check was helpful. But if I didn't have that foundation, there would have been plenty of times that maybe I had the talent to do something, but my attitude, because I didn't get what I wanted, because I didn't, I wasn't treated the way I thought I should have been, mm -hmm. I would have not made it. And that almost happened my sophomore year in college when after a great freshman year, I was on the cover of the the Miami Herald sports section as a freshman. And mm -hmm. then the very next year, I wasn't playing at all. I got demoted to the scout team mm -hmm. mid season. And I would call my dad constantly throughout the, the weeks kind of crying. But had I not had someone in my ear keeping me focused on what was most important and encouraging me, then I for sure would have lashed out and self-sabotaged. Yeah. Oh, what a blessing there. And it makes me think of when you wrote in the book about how, you know, and maybe this was the exact same time when you went back, like so many of the people had quit the team, you know, and then even after camp, you know, or, or you know, training, like even more people quit. And what a testament to your perseverance, um, regardless what was kind of going on with you there. Yeah. Did you actually bring those poems into your mind in times of difficulty? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Especially going through just like one of those just tough ruts that you're going through in your life. Mm -hmm. And when you, for me, when I would start to see the light at the end of the tunnel, like just mm -hmm. kind of seeing the way out, I would just kind of recite Invictus in my head, just reminding myself, like, you're, you're always in control. Mm -hmm. Like you, you can get through this. Yeah. It, and I talk about that all the time with my clients and in the space of like, we've got to give our mind what we want it to think. And it really, it quiets down all the other noise that maybe our mind is feeding us, especially for you from like past experiences, right? Or even just being demoted, like we can let that fester in our mind and dictate how we feel and what we're going to do, or you can really feed it what you want it to operate off of. And it truly makes such a difference. Like, I don't feel like people really truly grasp that, that just by choosing our words and telling our mind what we want it to hear, you know, or what we want it to focus on, it literally changes us physically, our actions and what we do. 100%. When I was going into my junior year in college, I was, so my sophomore year, I get demoted mid-season, not playing at all. Mm -hmm. Junior year barely playing so i still had hopes and aspirations of playing in the nfl but it wasn't looking likely at that point okay. but yeah. going into my senior year i wrote on my phone screensaver i just wrote out a note to myself that it only takes one year all mm -hmm. i have to do is just make the most out of this moment in front of me and by shifting my mindset in that way i was able to look for opportunities that were always present but now I was focusing on how I could make an impact for myself to the focus shifted from getting to the NFL. Like I need to get on the field. So what can I do mm -hmm. to just get on the field? And from that, I, I focused on blocking and tight ends. There are really the prolific pass catching tight ends, like the Travis Kelsey's of the world. 
Uh, we had a great one and Clive Walford. Uh, and so I knew the passes were not coming to me, but tight ends mm-hmm. also have to block. So I could carve out a real role for myself if I become the best blocker I could be. So now whenever we're going to run the ball or throw the ball deep, I have to be on the field. Mm -hmm. So just from shifting my mindset to focusing on, I should be getting, I I should be getting the passes. I should be getting this to focus on like, okay, what can I do? I help myself out tremendously. I love that. The first words that come to my mind are, you know, responsibility and, you know, ditching that victim mentality. You literally started to focus on the things that you could control and zone in and and go after it. Yeah. Yeah. You make it sound easy when you say it, but this is one of the hardest things for people to do. I mean, a lot of people live in that state of victim mentality where things are happening to them and they focus on what they can't control and why they should be here, even though they're not there. What did it take? Like, how do you shift to go into that space of like not focusing on that and focusing on what you could control and what you want to take responsibility for? For me, I think in that time, it was easier because there's an end date. I have Mm. one year left. Mm. And if I don't change it now, then it's not going to happen. So Mm -hmm. having that time pressure makes it easier for you to focus or collapse. Right. But I focused on it. But in terms of when you're trying to shift your mindset with there's no real pressure, it's just you are prolonging the time you would eventually get to where you want to go. It's Mm -hmm. just realizing how, when is enough enough for you? Like, when are you going to do what you know you have to do to get to where you want to go? Mm -hmm. That choice, right? Are you going to stay, you know, are you going to endure this forever and deal Mm -hmm. with this or are you going to make a different choice? Yeah. And choose a different mindset. Yeah. One of uh, the favorite things that I read in your book that you wrote was um, the world doesn't remember how many times you have fallen only if you get back up. I imagine there were several times where you felt like you had fallen. Yeah. Especially college was the first real time where I experienced adversity without really a safety net mm. from being across the country and it's not like my dad could come and talk to the coach and things would magically change. Like I had to get out of this hole myself. I had people who could give me support and give me advice. I, like I said, I would call my dad all the time after practice Mm -hmm. and that encouragement helps, but I had to do the work and it's, it's so rewarding when you keep the promise to yourself that you do what you know you can do Mm. and experiencing like the joy of just knowing that you're right. Like you, you believed in yourself before anyone else did. And even though you got knocked down, it didn't look pretty. If you got there, who cares what it looked like? Mm Mm-hmm. That believing in yourself is so crucial. You know, I talk about like trusting so that you can lead yourself. That obviously didn't necessarily come easy for you because you had this constant source of of someone basically saying you weren't enough, right? And that there was something wrong. So how is it that you found that kind of faith and that trust in yourself to believe that when you say it feels so good? It was... I, I had people who believed in me mm-hmm. and that helps a lot. It's, it's a true blessing. If you have people in your life who are encouraging, supportive, because not everybody has that. So if you right. do have that in your life, be extremely grateful for it. And like my dad was that for me and his belief in me, sometimes it felt a little over the top, mm. but it it encouraged me that I could do it. And then when I did, when I went undrafted to the 49ers, it was kind of back at the, the bottom of the totem pole. But I believe that since I got here, I can, I can make it. And through just 
all the rounds of cuts, I just focused on not being complacent and just doing the best I could. One of the first uh, instances in when I was in the league that taught me this was I we went through the preseason and after the fourth preseason game, I had a touchdown. So I'm thinking like I'm for sure going to make the team. I didn't. They ended up signing me to the practice squad, which is good. I was on the team still. Mm -hmm. And then 20 minutes after I signed to the practice squad, I get a call to come back to the facility. In my mind, I'm thinking, did I leave something? Mm -hmm. And I go to the GM's office and he says, hey, we're going to let you go. We found someone else that we liked Mm -hmm. and we might bring you back week two or week three. But yeah, just keep working out and we'll we'll stay in contact. Wow. So in a matter of 20 minutes, without me doing anything, yeah, I had the opportunity taken away. Mm-hmm. And as I was packing up my hotel room, getting ready to drive back to Sacramento, luckily I was a couple hours away. It would have been much harder if I had to catch a flight. Mm-hmm. My agent called me, said that they worked it out and that I was still on on the team, oh my God. but I just go back and don't hold a grudge. Uh-huh. But that instance showed me that I can be gone at any minute. Mm-hmm. So let's not, let's not, let's not, let's not let it be because I wasn't doing all that I could. Right. Make sure right. that I'm not getting complacent in my role. Let's make sure that I'm still trying to get better and show them that, show them mm-hmm. that I'm still trying to mm-hmm. get better. So that was a real eye opener very early in the NFL for me. It was not going to be for a lack of trying on your part. Yes. Yeah. And that, I mean, first of all, I've had like seven goosebump moments in this conversation already. (laughs) You are so full of so much inspiration and just perseverance, you know, I mean, true athleticism to, you know, from a mindset perspective to continually you know, suffer the blows of, you know, maybe not it going the way you want it to and not getting the position you wanted and being removed and injured and everything else. And you just kept coming back again and again. And I wonder, you know, for you, you talk about like finding that bright spot in life. Like you obviously have done that time and time again. So where do people do that for themselves or, or how can people do that for themselves when it feels so dark and challenging. I think finding the bright spot comes from gratitude and mm-hmm. just no matter how dark things are, no matter if things just aren't going your way, you have so much to be grateful for. Mm-hmm. And it's important that you rec- acknowledge that, take inventory of it. And for me, it was finding gratitude. After I retired, I struggled. Let's, I, I don't even want it to seem like I just have it all figured out all the time. No, I struggled Uh mightily. And it was for about two years where I was in a rut. I kept just not finding what made sense. I was doing a bunch of things. I felt out of context to who I was, Mm -hmm. but at the same time, I didn't know who I was. And it got to the point where I finally just started taking inventory of like what I was grateful for. And I noticed that the depression really subsided Mm. once I started focusing on that because I was looking at everything from a position of lack. I was Mm -hmm. focusing on what I didn't have that other people had, what other people were doing that I wasn't doing. Mm -hmm. And once I was grateful for everything I did have, I was more present, more in the moment and depression And anxiety can't live in the moment. So you will find those bright spots in your life when you really sit down and think about what you have to be grateful for. For me, I write it down in a journal. I write it down in a Uh, journal. The morning mindset journal. The morning mindset journal. (laughs) And it's, it's just a great way to remind yourself, no matter what, like you do have things going well for you. You woke up. You have people who love you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's where you'll find the bright, the bright spots for yourself. 
you are so speaking my language right now. You know how I feel about that being in the present moment, um, finding gratitude, all of those things. I think are a huge component of, you know, your best life and success. And you speak about almost here, you're saying like once good things crowd bad things out, in my opinion. So you bring in that gratitude and you know what you're saying, like, here comes abundance and the scarcity gets pushed out, you know, the judgment and the comparison, there isn't room for those when you're in the present moment. And all of a sudden you're in the state of gratitude and abundance. And I'm so glad you said that because I feel like a lot of people take this gratitude thing as this woo wooey, like, Oh, I'm grateful for this. I'm grateful for that. And, you know, I spend my life trying to get people to understand, like, this is not just some words that you throw out. Like, this is, it's scientific, the way it affects our brain and our thought process when we come up with gratitude on a daily basis. So I'm glad you shared that. Yeah. Yeah, it, 100%. I Gratitude is the best gift that I gave myself mm. through this transition. And especially it's so, so great when you actually write it down because yeah. you can then go back and look a year or two years prior and see like where you were as a mindset, mm -hmm. what you were focusing on, what we were trying to bring into your life at that time. And it's incredible when you can look back at what you wanted and realize I'm, I'm here. I got those yes. things. And even if things don't feel great for you. You can look at this and say, you know what? I have come a long way and I still have, I still have ways to go, but I'm grateful for the growth and progress that I've made so far. 100%. And you know what I love too about that writing it down is that when we're in the thick of it and you, you tell me if you have a different opinion here, but when you're in the thick of it, sometimes your mind can't see that. Right. And you have so much darkness and so much negativity that you can't find it. But if you pick up that book and you start reading it, your words don't lie. What you wrote down that you were grateful for yesterday and the day before and last week and last month, it's all there. So you don't have to be the one to come up with these thoughts in the moment and find that the light in the dark, you can actually look to what you've experienced. And those are facts. Right. And you, you have it right there to rewire your brain. Yes. I try to write down at least three things I'm grateful for. And I'm curious as to your strategy when you're journaling, mm -hmm. do you ever write about when you are struggling and just like taking inventory of like today sucked because X, Y, and Z? Yeah. I mean, I think that first question in the morning mindset journal, when it says like, I feel sometimes it is, I feel crappy, you know, I feel overwhelmed. I feel stressed. I feel, you know, anxious, whatever it is you're feeling, we have to, like you said, create awareness, right? So it's like, I bring that up, but that next question of empowerment, like, what am I going to do about it? That's my cue to say, I don't have to stay in that state. What do I want to do? So I'm a, I'm a big fan and believer in not ignoring how you feel, calling it out and then doing something about it. Um, and in the gratitude section, I'm curious how you feel about this too. Like there's two parts of gratitude for me. One, the things that are very evident that you're grateful for, right? Whether it's something that went your way or your loved ones or, you know, your health, all of that. It's kind of like, yeah, those are great things to be grateful for. But for me, I put those struggles in the gratitude section. You know, so if something didn't go my way, if I have a disagreement with my kid, if, you know, the the car broke down, I'm grateful for those. I'm grateful for those because that's what expands my mind. That's what allows me to see things from a different perspective once I take that wall of, you know, it being the bad thing and that victim mentality, I can see it differently. That's a very great way to look at it. I don't think I've ever done that in the moment, like as I was going through whatever struggle it was, but I mm -hmm. have written it down retrospectively when I feel like I've overcome it and mm -hmm. realize that I'm grateful for that struggle because I learned this. Right, right. Yeah. And, and I think that's a great way to, um, I might be a little over like, you know, excited about, I, I look at it from like, okay, what's going to come of this? There's mm -hmm. a reason why this happened. I went to yeah. go to the gym the other day and I forgot my car was in the shop and 
long story, my husband had sold his cars. My boys were already gone. So I went to leave for the gym and I had no car. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I text my trainer and I'm like, I'm going to be late. I'm going to, you know, ride the bike. And I go to get my e-bike and the tires are flat. And, um, I will be the first to admit that I was using the bike, bike pump wrong. Don't judge me, but I couldn't pump up the tires. Right. And it just felt like one thing after the other, I had to ride this old beat up 25 year old bike that had a, a split in a tire. I made it there, but I was like the whole time, like, I'm so grateful for this. Like, what's it going to be? And I was like, I'm riding my bike to the gym every day. Why am I not outside? Like you see it differently, right? If I didn't have that gratitude, I would have been like, can't make it today. And you know, my stupid car is gone or whatever. And so I, I just think that it's such a game changer in that moment. You instantly see what you're supposed to see from that other perspective. Yeah, you are a much healthier gratitude mindset than I am. I don't think I would have canceled, but I don't know how grateful I would have been for having to ride the bike. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's kind of like you were saying, you, you take your choice, right? Do you want to continue with this or do I want to see something different? And, you know, I got to the gym and, um, you know, I said to Willie, I was like, I was not going to lose that battle. Like I was not going to lose. <laughs> That's awesome. But gratitude gets you there. So I think it's so important for people to understand Yeah, every single day. It is just a mindset shifter. And that's something that you, you know, are a, a big component of. And all throughout your book, you talk about mindset, um, overcoming things and changing your mindset. And what else is super important outside of gratitude for you that really allows you to have the mindset you need to, you know, live your best life and succeed? Effort, uh, doing the best I can in mm -hmm. any given moment and understanding that my best today is not going to be the same best tomorrow, next week. Like as long as you're giving your best effort, you will continually improve. There are only two things in this world you can control. That's your attitude and your effort. So mm -hmm. for me, I was not a highly touted player coming out of high school. I didn't have incredible stats in college, but I gave great effort. And because of that, I made it to the NFL with only 14 catches in my four year college career. There are guys who get that in a game. Mm -hmm. And but I, I was just focused on doing the best I could all the time. So when you when you are in that mindset, you know that where you are today isn't going to be where you are tomorrow and all the mistakes you make, it's just you gaining experience and figuring out different ways not to do something. Yeah. But over time, your best just keeps getting better and better till you get to a point where you're a pro you mm -hmm. are like you're unstoppable. Once you are focused on your craft and continuously putting in the work, and you have a great mindset about it too. And you have a gratitude mindset, like who can stop you? Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I think you probably share the same belief that we are capable of whatever we want to put, you know, the effort around. For sure. And I think we both seen it happen so many times in other people, just mm -hmm. watching their personal growth and development, just to prove in your life that, oh, I can do anything. If, if this person can come from, their background, what they've accomplished, and still figure out how to get to this incredibly lofty spot just based mm -hmm. off how hard they worked, how committed they were, then it just reaffirms that anything is possible if you believe it is. 100%. Yeah. Love that. So you have given us so much of your wisdom already and just a way for, I think, people to see, like, how do you control that mindset? Some helpful tips on the journaling and gratitude. I mean, we have to highlight we've got somebody who is in the NFL, manly man who does gratitude and completes a journal. It works. It works. And so putting in the effort and mastering your craft, it all pays off all pays off. So I always like to ask my guests when, you know, what has been the most monumental or the most influential piece of wisdom that you've ever received for somebody else? I think from my dad, it was another just early lesson. Mm -hmm. I grew up playing soccer when I was a kid. That was my first sport that I really loved. 
Mm-hmm. And in fifth grade, I started playing organized basketball for the first time outside recess. Mm-hmm. And I was in this league and I just assumed that since I was a pretty good soccer player, that obviously I would be a good basketball player too. Uh-huh. And we were playing this game and there was a kid who was around my size. I was taller than most kids at that time. And this kid was really good. He basketball was for sure his favorite sport. I was just (laughs) learning to like it and it was for sure his favorite sport. And he kicked my butt up and down the Mm -hmm. court. And at that time I couldn't process that there was someone this much better than me at something. Mm. And I was crying on the bench. I was pouting all the way home when my dad took me home. And before we went home, we stopped at an outdoor basketball park Mm -hmm. and my dad just said, all right, Asante, I'm going to walk to that far baseline. And when I turn around, if you're not waiting for me at the free throw line, I'm going to walk back to the car, get in, drive away, and we will never talk about this again. Mm -hmm. But if you want to be great, you will be waiting for me at the free throw line. And he just got out and started walking. Now me, I'm wiping my tears away, still in my feelings a bit, Mm -hmm. but I eventually get out of the car and I run after him. And then when we finally meet up, he just gives me a big hug. And the wisdom was told me that that kid wasn't better than you, but he has worked at this way more than you have. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be great at anything, you have to be willing to work in the dark. You have Mm -hmm. to be willing to put in the work when no one is watching you and when no one is telling you to. So th- mm. that was the most influential wisdom that I got. Uh, I absolutely love that. I have to be willing to work in the dark when nobody else is watching you. And that's not easy. I mean, that's self-discipline right there. And it's what so many people lack. You know, we, we find it easy to perform when people are watching. Mm-hmm. Right. But on our own, yeah, it can be challenging. Well, I also want to thank you for being vulnerable, for sharing your story in your book, um, Working Through the Dark. Uh, Such a great story. And, you know, I mean, just so many great pieces for obviously somebody who's going through those challenges and and children who are suffering the child abuse. But so many other pieces in there, even if, you know, that's not your story and understanding how to work through the dark and find that gratitude and focus on your mindset. Your story is one that is truly inspirational. You know, you could have gone a much different way and you didn't, you know, you persevered and so much respect for you for that. Thank, Thank you, you for so joining much. Us, Asante. Thanks for having me.